Good evening, everyone. It's a handicap of being tall. Good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many people here tonight. On behalf of the Fitzpatrick Institute and the University of Cape Town, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this Vice Chancellor's Open Lecture. It's the second such occasion within almost as many years that the FITS has been involved in setting up one of these occasions. Um, just over two years ago, we were very privileged to bring David Attenborough here, and I'm sure many of you who attended that will be here again tonight and uh, remember that evening very fondly. Um, the opportunity to bring David here was brought about by his um, long friendship with Patrick Niven, who sadly has since died, but Patrick was a long-standing member of the FITS Advisory Board and uh, the son of Cecily Niven, who set up the Fitzpatrick Institute. And we brought David here in celebration of our 50th anniversary. And it's again through a connection of the Fitzpatrick Board that we're here tonight. So we have to thank Ms. Harriet Nimmo, uh, a member of the board for the last couple of years for arranging for our esteemed speaker to come and speak to us tonight, and I'm sure we're all looking forward to that. I've had a few people come to me and say, it's a bit odd, you know, having an ornithological institute promoting a primatologist to come and speak, and, you know, uh, what's all that about? Well, of, of course, most of you will probably realize that Jane Goodall is much more than a primatologist, and in the last couple of decades has really become a, quite a large player on the conservation and, and awareness of biodiversity conservation field. And indeed, she's even done some work with birds. Um, she's very passionate about parrot conservation. And recently, a couple of our postdocs were involved through the World Parrot Trust, uh, doing some rehabilitation work with African gray parrots with Jane in Uganda. And by the same token, the Fitzpatrick Institute is not just about birds. 25 years ago, the then director, Roy Siegfried, took the strategic decision to align the institute with conservation as one of its main thrusts, and that resulted in 1992 in the formation of the Conservation Biology Master's Program, which has trained about 250 master's graduates from all over the world, and I'm very pleased to see many of them here tonight, so a special welcome to you guys. Um, and this led to the Institute being recognized as a center for, ooh, now I've got, lost my thread. Um, what are we called? We are a center of excellence um, <laughs> using, using birds as uh, tools for, for conservation. So just like BirdLife International, we've seen the light and seen that birds are not the be-all and end-all, but we can use them as tools for broader biodiversity conservation. So I was asked to give a little spiel about the FITS, and that's about it for me, but it doesn't fall to me to introduce our guest speaker tonight. I get to introduce the, uh, the opening act, which is Mr. Dizu Bleikies, who is a graduate of UCT. He's a senior lecturer at the South African College of Music, but probably best known for founding in the late 1970s the African percussion group Amampondo, and he is in, and his ensemble will perform three pieces tonight before we get to the main event. Thank you very much. Molwen, how are you? Are we all okay? I just want to twist your tongue a little bit. Uh, here's the phrase So I want you when you walk out of this place after Dr. Goodall finishes his speech I want you to practice this phrase Do you know what you are saying? <laughs> All right, you are saying that the frogs are jumping in all the rivers. Yeah, the second one. Kriha. Ulu Sulwam. Lukwele. Gamakakova.
You are saying that, doctor, my face is full of pimples. Sani, 
Soul plucking, Kenneth Kawunda, Joe Silovong, Helen Susman, Nibo Nanam Nibo Nanam Aso se gamiri Robert Sobukwe Stevie Biko Kwame Mandela 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 Thank you so much, beautiful ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to thank you very much with all this beautiful music that we are opening for Dr. Goodell to come to have a talk with all of us. And I hope you enjoy each and every minute. You look so good, you're beautiful. Thank you very much.
Thank you, thank you very much, beautiful people. Enjoy the rest of the evening. God bless you. We love you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to Deza Plikis, who is the head of, our, uh, of the section of African Music at the South African College of Music of the University of Cape Town. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, students and staff, members of the public, and to those of you who are viewing this uh, as it is being live streamed on UCT's website, welcome to the first Vice Chancellor's Lecture of 2014 at the University of Cape Town. As some of you will know, the regular attenders, this series was established to enable anyone in the community, whether they were connected to the university or not, to have the benefit of hearing firsthand from academics, researchers, innovators from around the world who have distinguished themselves in their areas of expertise. We do not charge for attendance at these lectures because we view them as one of the ways in which UCT can give back to the Cape Town community. Lectures such as this one offer us a new way to appreciate our world and to inspire us to be better custodians of its resources. Tonight's guest speaker is especially adept at giving people a glimpse not only into the life of a field researcher, but into the minds and hearts of the species she has studied since 1960, the chimpanzees of East Africa. Jane Goodall grew up in England 
As a child, she dreamed of living among wild animals and writing about them. Tarzan and Dr. Doolittle were her favorite books. She, came, she first came to Africa when she visited a friend in Kenya in 1957. There she met Louis Leakey, the famed archaeologist and paleontologist, who hired her as an assistant and eventually asked Dr. Goodall to undertake a study of a group of wild chimpanzees living on a lake shore in what is now Tanzania. He reasoned that knowledge about wild chimpanzees, who were little understood at that time, could shed light on our evolutionary past. Dr. Goodall began her work for Leakey at Gombe, in what was then the British Protectorate of Tanganyika. She was accompanied by her mother, Bane, to satisfy the British authorities who didn't want a young woman living alone in the wild. Her research equipment consisted of a notebook, a pair of binoculars, and unyielding patience. It took weeks for her to find a vantage point where she could watch the shy chimpanzee who fled whenever they saw her, but eventually her perseverance paid off and she was able to observe and record aspects of the chimp's life that revolutionized our view of this species and our view of the fields of evolution. Chimps were thought to be vegetarians, but one day Dr. Goodall saw two chimpanzee feeding on a baby bush pig. She later saw chimpanzees hunting monkeys and other small mammals many times at Gombe. Within two weeks of that first meat eating, she saw chimps stripping the leaves of stems so that they could insert, into the, insert these stems into a termite mound to fish for insects. The Gomba chimps were making and using tools. At that time, anthropologists saw tool making as a defining trait of mankind. When Dr. Goodall wrote to Leakey of her discovery, he replied, quote, now we must redefine tool, redefine man, or accept chimpanzees as humans. Leakey arranged for Dr. Goodall, who had no degree, to enroll at Cambridge University as a doctoral student. There she was mentored in formal scientific methodology and taught how to lay a firm foundation for the long-term data collection at Gombe. As a scientist, she stood out from other ethologists, for, for our new fresher first-year students, ethologists are people who study animal behavior. Um, they understood animal behavior to be impersonal, driven by instinct, but Dr. Goodall saw the chimps as individuals with distinct personalities, minds, and emotions. She gave the chimpanzees names instead of numbers in her writings. This was unheard of at the time. She later observed opposing tribes of chimpanzees engaging in warfare. She also witnessed adult male chimps adopting orphaned baby chimps and acting the part of surrogate mothers. Dr. Goodall's observations were published in National Geographic with photos by filmmaker photographer Hugo van Lavik, who became Dr. Goodall's first husband. As the level of support for the Gombe study increased, Dr. Goodall and Hugo built a permanent camp which later became the Gombe Stream Research Center. She moved on, or she continued with research, but her interests also expanded to environmental activism. Her book, The Chimpanzees of Gombe, Patterns of Behavior, was published in 1986. That year, in a conference in Chicago with chimp biologists, she began to realize the widespread and urgent threats that were already facing wild chimps. This is where Dr. Goodall's chimp activism was born. Today, she is on the road more than 300 days out of the year, at an age when most people would long have retired. Her work now revolves around inspiring action on behalf of endangered species, particularly chimpanzees, and encouraging people to do their part to make the world a better place for people, animals, and the environment that we all share. The Jane Goodall Institute works to protect the famous chimpanzee of Gombe National Park in Tanzania with a comprehensive approach that addresses the needs of local people who are critical to chimpanzee survival. These sustainable development projects engage local people as partners, and these program, programs began, around, began in Gombe in 1994 and have since been replicated in many other parts of the continent. Another organization she started, called Roots and Shoots, 
with a group of Tanzanian students in 1991, is today the Institute's Global Environmental and Humanitarian Youth Program for young people from preschool through university, with nearly 150,000 members in more than 120 countries. In recognition of Dr. Goodall's lifetime achievements with CHIMPS and her continuing environmental and humanitarian work, in April 2002, United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan named Dr. Goodall a UN Messenger of Peace. In 2003, she was named the Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire. Her many other honors include the Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement, the French Legion of Honor, Medal of Tanzania, Japan's prestigious Kyoto Prize, the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Life Science, the Gandhi King Award for Nonviolence, and the Spanish Prince of Asturias Awards. She is also a member of the advisory board of BBC Wildlife magazine and a patron of Population Matters. Dr. Goodall's passion nowadays is to spark fresh support for these two programs, Roots and Shoots and the Jane Goodall Institutes. For example, just today, having just arrived in South Africa, she has spent the day in schools in Mitchell's Plain and in Rondebosch, motivating hundreds of students, of young students, into these causes. So may I suggest to you that since, as I mentioned earlier, the Vice Chancellor's lectures are always free, that you show your support after the, after the lecture uh, by making donations to one of these institutions. You will find slips being handed out in the foyer after we close. And if I may be so bold to suggest that a 150 rand donation would be most appropriate. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Goodall to the podium to tell us tonight how we can be part of this important work. I've got him captive. Um, first of all, I can't see you very well, but good evening to all of you and thank you for coming. And you've heard a good deal about chimpanzee behavior. And I wanted to start with one demonstration and I need somebody <laughs> to uh, help me with this. Right. So, um, I, I, this, I can't move this, can I? Does this come off so that I can... You can take it off. Let's take it off. Okay, so we are going to demonstrate... Hello? It doesn't like being moved. Try again. Uh, we're going to demonstrate what happens when a female chimpanzee greets a male. And the first thing I have to say is you're used to baboons here, but chimpanzees don't move around in troops. They have a community of about 50 at Gombe, but within that community you can see males on their own, little groups of males, females and their youngsters, they're dependent offspring, groups of females, sometimes females meet males, and sometimes lots of them join together if there's a, a delectable food that's ripe in one place. But one of the things that's so striking about the chimps is how they resemble us. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But while I have my captive, uh, um, what do you call, what do you call you? Something you're going to help me. No, not a host. You're a, um, you're, you're a, you're, you're, you're a, no, you're, a, you're something, a partner in action or something. I do it. Anyway. Okay. So point is, I'm the female. In chimp society, males are dominant. That's the way it is. And males are much stronger than females. So if I've been away from this male for a while, uh, there's a bit of excitement, you know. And um, the male uh, is dominant, and he kind of bristles up and looks big and strong. <laughs> yes, that's right. And, and this is my Facebook photo opportunity. <laughs> so if he had hair all over his body, which is one of the differences, it would all be bristled. So he can bristle. His, actually, your hair is quite bristly. Yes, quite good. So anyway, now the point is that the, the subordinate, which is me, makes little sounds of greeting, but the dominant one is totally silent. And that's how you know who's dominant. So I'm a little bit nervous because he is looking big and bristly. And so I come up with very soft, oh, 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 oh. and as I get closer, oh, 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 bending down a bit, oh, 
He actually likes me, so he reaches one hand and gently pats my head. And then, come a bit nearer because of chords, and then um, we greet. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that demonstration, Mr. Vice-Chancellor. Um, I dare say that's the first time you've been asked to act as a male chimpanzee. <laughs> anyway, that's the close-up greeting. But there is also a greeting which is really important. It's, it's more of a, uh, an announcement. As I've said, chimps live in the scattered uh, community, scattered members of a community. So it's really important for them to know where the other chimpanzees are. And so every chimpanzee has a distinctive call which announces, this is me, here I am. And it's the sound you hear if you come to Gombe or any other place where the chimpanzees live and listen, especially early in the morning, and you'll hear, <laughs> Hello, this is Jane. And then I listen, who's out there? And this is a really important call. And it's one of those communication uh, patterns that for the first few months, several months when I was at Gombe, it was very confusing. Chimpanzee behavior was very confusing. Their society is tremendously complex. It's what we call fusion vision, and that's when individuals meet and then separate. And in chimp society, they separate into different groupings. And so it was very confusing to start with. And the worst problem when I first got there was that they are very conservative. They'd never seen a white ape before. <laughs> and so they would take one look and vanish into the vegetation. And as the weeks went by, I was getting increasingly concerned because at the start there was only money for six months. As you've heard, I had no degree at the time. And so, it was very difficult for Lewis Leakey to find money for this crazy idea. A young woman, straight from England, no degree, going out into what was potentially dangerous. And eventually we got money from a wealthy, or Lewis got money from a wealthy American businessman, but it was just for six months. And as you've heard, the authorities wouldn't let me be alone, so my mother was there. At this point, I want to make a big Thank you to my mother for the role that she's played in my life. It all began when I was a small child. When I was just one and a half, I already, apparently, I don't remember this, but already I was showing a love and an interest in animals. And she came up to my room one day when I was 18 months old and found I'd taken a whole handful of earthworms to bed with me. <laughs> well, a lot of mothers would have said, ugh, throw those dirty things out. How dare you bring them to your bed? But she didn't. She said very gently, Jane, they need the earth or they'll die. And so we took them back into the garden. And then comes a very interesting observation or incident in, in retrospect. I was four and a half. We lived in London where there aren't so many animals. And with my passion for animals, how exciting to go to a farm in the country, and a proper farm, not the kind of intensive farming that so many animals are subjected to today, but the old-fashioned farm, still many in South Africa, where the animals graze in the fields and so forth. And meeting cows and pigs and horses close up was really exciting. And I was given a job to help collect the hen's eggs. Well, I don't remember this, but apparently I began asking everybody, but where does the egg come out of the hen? Because here's the egg. Where was the hole big enough for the egg to come out? And obviously nobody told me to my satisfaction. What I remember, and I remember really clearly, four and a half, remember, and I saw a hen and she was climbing up. They had a little gangplank into these small wooden hen houses, probably a bit higher than this. I think there were about six of them. And all around the edge were nest boxes. So I, my job was to go around the edge, open up the lids of the boxes. If there was an egg, put it in my basket. 
And I remember seeing this hen going into, her, into the hen house and thinking, ah, she's going to lay an egg, and following her. Well, that was a big mistake, because if you have a choice, you don't want four and a half year old little girls crawling after you into where you're going to lay an egg. So with squawks of, I suppose, fear, she flew out. Now, isn't this amazing at four and a half? And I remember this so clearly thinking, no hen will lay an egg here. This is now a dangerous place. And by now, you know, I'm all on the trail of success. So I went into an empty hen house and waited and waited and waited, which is fine for me. But my poor family had no idea where I was. <laughs> Dusk was beginning to fall. They were all out searching for me. And you can imagine how scared my mother was. Her little four and, year, four and a half year old daughter had disappeared. And she saw me running towards the house all covered in straw. So many mothers would have said, how dare you go off without telling us? Don't you know how worried we've made us? Don't you dare do it again. But she sat down to listen to the story of how a hen lays an egg. And if you look at that with hindsight, isn't that the making of a little scientist? The curiosity, asking questions, not getting the right answer, deciding to find out for yourself, making a mistake, not giving up, and learning patience. It was all there, and all of that curiosity might have been crushed if I'd had a different sort of mother. And it was she who found me books to read about animals because she knew that would make me read quicker because I was so interested. Dr. Doolittle was my first, uh, the first book I read where Dr. Doolittle takes animals from the circus back to Africa. Yes, that was exciting. And then I was 10 years old and I was in a secondhand bookshop where I spent hours. Because remember, or maybe you don't even know, but back then there was no television. Everything was books, and we had so little money, we couldn't afford a new book, and World War II was raging. My father was off fighting, and so I haunted these second-hand bookshops, particularly one of them, and I found this little book, Tarzan of the Apes, and I just had enough saved-up pocket money to buy it, and I took it home, and I climbed my favorite tree, and I read that book from cover to cover, and I read it from cover to cover again, and of course, being a romantically minded little girl, I fell passionately in love with Tarzan. <laughs> and what did he do? He married the wrong Jane. <laughs> well, of course, I knew there wasn't a real Tarzan, but that was when my dream began, to go to Africa, live with animals, and write books about them. I didn't want to be a scientist. And Everybody laughed at me. How would I do that? I mean, at that time, Africa was the dark continent. We knew very little about it. As I've said, the war was raging. As I've said, we had very little money. There were no tourist planes flying back and forth. And I was a mere girl. And back then, and we're going back 70 years now, girls didn't have those opportunities. The excitement and the adventure, that was for a boy. But girls, no. So. Jane, why don't you dream about something you can achieve? You'll never get to Africa. But my mother didn't say that. She said, if you really want something and you really work hard and you take advantage of opportunity and you never give up, you will find a way. That's what I was telling the, the students from the township this morning. That's what I tell children around the world. And so many of them have written to me afterwards and said, you taught me that because you did it, I can do it too. And it was my mother who was responsible for all of that. And so when I left school, there was no money for university. It was again my mother who said, well, do a secretarial course, then maybe you can get a job in Africa. So I did that, I was working in London, and then came this letter from a school friend inviting me to Kenya. Wow, opportunity. But couldn't save money in London, so I went home and I worked as a waitress. And it was one of the old-fashioned hotels, not the sort where people drop in for an expensive lunch or dinner and the waiters and waitresses get big tips. No, this was after the war. People came down from up north and they didn't have much money and they came for a week's holiday by the seaside. So you had to work really hard for a week 
and they couldn't afford big tips, but I made sure they all knew I was saving up for Africa, so I got a bigger tip than I might have. At any rate, eventually I had enough for a return fare to Africa. And by boat, because in those days that was really the only way to go, the airplanes were way too expensive. So I was 23, waved goodbye to my family and my friends and my country, and set off on this amazing adventure. Today, lots of young people of 23, 24, younger even, go off on trips around the world. But in those days, just after the war, it really didn't happen, especially girls. And my mother was actually accused of being irresponsible for letting me go. But fortunately, she paid no attention. And so, what I want to share with you is the very first footstep I made on African soil was right here in Cape Town. 1957, the boat I was on came all the way around Africa to Kenya because the Suez Canal was closed because of the Egyptian war. And so I stepped ashore right here in Cape Town, but a very different Cape Town. I know I went by cable car to the top of um, the mountain, Table Mountain. I know there were Zulus dressed up in all their, all their finery with rickshaws. And I know I hated coming here. And why did I hate it? Because on all the benches, all the doors, all the restaurants, everywhere, there were little notices saying, whites only, whites only, whites only. And I couldn't understand it. And when I went to Durban, where the ship next stopped, it was the same. And then finally, we got to Mombasa, and I went to stay with my friend, and I heard about Louis Leakey. And somebody said, Jane, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Lewis. So I went to the Natural History and Museum, uh, the Natural History Museum in, in Nairobi, where he was curator. And I think, you see, I'd followed my mother's advice. I'd gone on and on reading about animals in Africa. I'd spent hours in the Natural History Museum in, uh, in, Nairobi, in, in London, in my lunch hours when I was working there. So when I went to see Leakey, he took me around, he asked me hundreds of questions. And because I'd done all this preparation, I could answer many of them. That's why he gave me a job first as his secretary. You see, the wisdom of my mother, there I was, ready, <laughs> and he gave me a job as a secretary. And then he took me to a place that's now very famous, uh, which is Olduvai Gorge. That's where many human fossils have been found. And he worked with one of the paleontologists who's very famous here in South Africa, who was one of the first South Africans I met, and that was Philip Tobias. Leakey shared the finds, the fossils, with Philip Tobias, who came to look at them. And Leakey was very secretive. He didn't share them with many other people. And so I got to know Philip Tobias quite early. But this trip that Lewis let me go on with his wife and one other young English girl and just a few Kenyans. When I went to Olduvai Gorge in 1958, it was, a, it was a place that I'd dreamed of and imagined about Africa because the, no human fossils had been found, only the fossils of various prehistoric creatures. And so all the animals were there. It was a different world. It was like a pristine Kruger before it had to be surrounded by a fence, before helicopters came in to poach rhinos. The most humans we saw in three months were maybe four Maasai Marani. And Gillian and I were allowed out on the plains every evening after the hard work of searching for fossils under the hot sun. And we would meet the antelopes and the dick dicks. One evening it was a rhino. Luckily the wind was blowing from him to us and he ran off in the other direction. And then one evening, it was a young male lion. He was full-sized, little bits of mane coming off his shoulders, and he followed Julian and me probably twice the length of this room, maybe more, something like that. And as you can imagine, it was a little bit scary. I mean, you know, he was curious. He'd never seen anything like us before. But it was also very exciting. And I do believe it was that evening around the campfire that Lewis decided to ask me if I was prepared to go and try and learn about the chimpanzees. And of course, yes. But then we had to find the money, and we got the six months. 
And then I had to have a companion, and yes, my mother agreed to come, or she volunteered. And she boosted my morale because as I was getting desperate, as the weeks went by and the chimps ran away, and I knew when the money ran out that would be the end, and she would say, but Jane, you are actually finding out a lot. You found that peak. You've seen how the chimpanzees move in these small groups and sometimes meet and separate differently. You've seen how they make sleeping platforms or nests up in the trees. And you've seen the kind of foods they eat, because I used to climb down and collect them. She said, actually, you're learning a lot. So she, it was really fantastic having her there in those early days. And how sad. She left after four months, just before that groundbreaking discovery of the tool using and the tool making. And the sad thing was that there was nobody to share this excitement I felt. And I didn't hear how exciting it really was until I got that telegram back from Lewis Leakey. No emails back then. No faxes even. And a lot of people I speak to today have no idea what a telegram is. But that was the only way we had. And we used the telegrams very infrequently because it was very expensive. And you counted the words carefully because you paid so much a word. And anyway, back came this. And it was that observation, that tool using and tool making, that brought in the National Geographic. And it was because the National Geographic then came in with money for me to continue sitting out there in Gombe that the chimpanzees of Gombe could travel around the world into the homes of so many millions of people through their magazines and their documentaries. Well, as you heard, Lewis Leakey got me a place at Cambridge University. And when I got this letter saying I would be studying ethology, I hadn't the faintest idea what ethology was. I couldn't Google it. <laughs> I had to wait and be told, oh, it just means studying behavior. We think of it as animal behavior, but it can be human behavior too. We call it human ethology. And it was a bit nerve wracking. And when I got to university and was told, as you've heard, that I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names, they should have had numbers, and I couldn't talk about them having personalities or minds capable of decision-making uh, or solving problems, and absolutely not emotions. That's anthropomorphic. That's attributing human emotions to non-human beings, and that was absolutely forbidden. But fortunately, naive though I was, never having been to college, and being slightly in awe of these professors. Nevertheless, I had a wonderful teacher when I was a child. And that teacher taught me absolutely that those professors were completely wrong. <laughs> and that teacher, that was my dog, Rusty. <laughs> and you cannot share your life in a meaningful way with a dog or a cat, a rabbit, a horse, a cow, I don't care what it is, and not know that the professors were wrong. You can't go and watch elephants in the field. You can't look at the baboons that you have here in Cape Town and not know that the professors were wrong. And fortunately, I had a wonderful uh, supervisor. He was uh, initially my sternest critic. And then he came to Gombe, and that changed him. So then he set himself out to help me to write about my, my discoveries in my own terminal, my own way of thinking, my own philosophy, but in such a way that I would be less likely to be attacked by other scientists. And I'll give you students one tip, because it's been very useful to me. I wrote one of my early um, chapters for my thesis, and it was very naive. I don't know how Robert Hind put up with me, but he did. And I had said that Flo, the female chimpanzee, had a new baby, and her older daughter, five, six-year-old Fifi, uh, loved this baby. She followed around her mother. She was always wanting to touch or groom the baby or play with his little hand or foot. And the mother always brushed her away, but gently. And if another youngster came up to try and have a look, Fifi would bristle up and wave her hand and chase them away with shrill calls. And I had said, naively, she was jealous. Robert Hines said, but Jane, you can't say that because you can't prove it. 
And I said, well, no, I, of course I can't prove it, but I'm sure she was. What, what can I say? Now, listen to what he said. He said, I suggest you say that Fifi behaved in such a way that had she been a human child, we would say she was jealous. <laughs> now, don't forget that. It's very, very useful. It taught me how to play with words in such a way that you, it, it's very good in a law court too, that sort of thinking. <laughs> so anyway, um, so anyway, there I was with Robert's backing. I got my PhD, I settled down to learn more and more about the chimps, built up the research station. It was the life I dreamed of as a child. And as the years followed each other, began to learn things like the long, term supportive bonds, affectionate bonds between family members, mothers and their offspring, brothers and sisters, which can last through life. And I began to learn that chimpanzees like us have this dark side, they're capable of violence, brutality, and even a primitive war, but they also show uh, characteristics of love and compassion and true altruism, as when a non-related male adopts an orphan infant. And the likenesses between humans and chimpanzees became stronger and stronger. It was obvious that in chimp society, as in human society, there are good mothers and bad mothers. The good mothers are protective, but not overprotective. And they're playful, and they're affectionate, but most important, they're supportive. And even if their child gets into an interaction with an individual who's higher ranking than their mother, the mother will run to support them nevertheless even though she may get attacked. And the offspring of those mothers grow up to be assertive. The females tend to be good, successful mothers. The males tend to rise higher in the dominance hierarchy. And the other mothers, most of them are sort of mediocre. They have to be, otherwise the race would die out, the species would die out. But they're less protective. They're less supportive, they're less affectionate, they're less playful, and their offspring tend to, to find it difficult to form relaxed relations with other individuals. And the females tend to be less successful as mothers, and the males tend never to rise quite so high in the hierarchy. Now these facts have not yet been fully analyzed, but all the data is in a university in America. All of it is being put in digital form, and we already have students working on some of these long-term results. Every year that we go on studying them, the study becomes more valuable. Every year, even though it's now 54 years of work, we're finding out new things. And when students come up to me and say, oh, but you found out everything we need to know. No, we haven't. We still come up with strange questions of why did this chimpanzee do that? And they all have their own personalities, their own individuality. And so we're collecting up all these life histories and beginning to work out the role played by experience versus uh, instinct, learning versus instinct, the old thing. And of course, it's a mixture of both but we're getting some quite interesting information which eventually will all be published. So if any of you are interested in studying chimpanzees or any other creature for that matter, there is still a lot to learn. When I got to Cambridge and talked about chimpanzees using objects as tools and having minds that could solve problems, and I was ridiculed, it was the chimpanzees who helped to break down what was perceived as a sharp line dividing humans from the rest of the animal kingdom. They made it very clear that we are not the only beings on this planet with personalities, minds, and emotions. And once we break down that sharp line, then we realize that the other animals too, so many amazing animals with whom we share or should share this planet, also have personalities and minds and emotions. And you probably all know that. That's what makes it so horribly tragic what's happening to the elephants and rhinos. It's not just destroying the species, it's individual suffering, it's individual life histories being ended, it's infants being left orphaned with their futures destroyed. And there is a big controversy today between environmentalists who talk about saving a species and don't find the individual important 
And those of us who feel very strongly that a species is made up of individuals and there's this rich cultural life in so many of these animals out there. And so poaching is despicable because it's harming this as well as threatening with extinction so many of the amazing species with whom we, as I say, should be sharing the planet. Why did I leave Gombe? It was my dream world. I left it because, as you heard, I learned in 1986 that right across Africa, chimpanzee numbers were decreasing. Right across Africa, where we used to talk about the equatorial forest belt when I was young, the forests were being destroyed. There were increasingly small, fragmented patches of, of forest. Today, there are probably maximum 300,000 chimps, and they're spread over 21 nations in Africa. And in many cases, they're in small, isolated pockets of forest where they are genetically isolated, where they will have no chance of long-term survival unless we work even harder to make corridors, leafy corridors, <coughs> linking up the different forest patches. And back then, when I first realized what was going on, I uh, realized that the beginning of the bushmeat trade, the commercial hunting of wild animals for food, realized how increasing populations in Africa were moving further and further into the forests, as they were into other habitats, thus threatening other animals like elephants with extinction. I learned about the fact that so many chimpanzees were caught in these wire snares, and even though they can strong enough to break the snare or to pull out the stake, they can't get the tightened wire from around their wrist or ankle, and so many were losing a hand or a foot or dying of gangrene. And also, as we have learned increasingly, the human populations moving into the forest, particularly the foreign logging companies and the foreign mining companies, taking new diseases into the forest, and chimpanzees are genetically so similar to us, differing by only just over 1.5%, and having an immune system almost the same, <clears throat> so that they can catch our known contagious diseases, just as we can catch theirs. But they have no immunity to our diseases. They've never been in contact with Western disease before. And all of this combining to put chimpanzees and gorillas and bonobos under increasing threat. I don't know what I thought I could do. I came out of that conference a different person. I went in as a scientist. I had a wonderful life. I came out as an activist. And I just knew I had to do something. And I went to Africa with an ex exhibition. And I took it around some of the African countries where chimpanzees range. And I tried to have wildlife awareness weeks working with local NGOs and local government ministries. And I gave talks and I went into schools. And what happened when I was doing that is that I learned more and more about the problems facing not just chimpanzees and their forest homes, but the people of Africa as well. And I came to believe that many of these problems, not all of them, but many of them, can be traced back to the old colonialism. I realized that today, many of the problems are caused in the same sort of way by some of the big multinationals. And in both cases, whether it was colonialism or the multinationals today, not all of them, but many of them, it's going in to take Africa's natural resources, to make money, to leave a few people in Africa very rich with Swiss bank accounts, but to make the majority of the people in those areas where the work is being done poorer. And that's why I decided I needed to go and talk about some of these issues in Europe, uh, in North America, Canada, and the USA, and then increasingly in Asia. And we all know the problems that Africa is facing as other developed countries as well, because of the Chinese desire to, to fuel their economic boom with materials from outside their own country. They're not doing any worse than we did. I have to keep saying that. But there are more of them, and they have more sophisticated technology, and they probably have more money than we had back then. But anyway, the, 
They are all over Africa. They are causing problems. And so I was working more in Asia and then uh, other countries as well. And as I was traveling around and learning about the problems of Africa, the problems of the wildlife, the problems of the people, I flew over Gombe National Park, which is tiny, it's only 30 square miles. And I flew over in a small plane, and we were able to go over what we call the Greater Gombe Ecosystem. That's way out beyond Gombe, which is on the shore of Lake Tanganyika. And I knew there was deforestation in the area, but I was utterly shocked to see that this little island of forest that was Gombe was surrounded by bare hills. The forest that I knew was there in 1960 had gone. There were more people living there than the land could possibly support. They were too poor to buy food from elsewhere. The land was over-farmed and infertile. There was terrible soil erosion. The little streams were getting silted up. And the poverty was dreadful. That's when I realized we can't even try to save these famous chimpanzees while people are struggling to survive. And that led to our program, we call it Take Care or Takari, which is trying to improve the lives of the African people in a very holistic way. And I think the, the success of the program can really be traced back to the man that I worked with at the beginning called George Strunden, who'd been in Tanzania 15 years. It was his genius that put together an amazing team of local Tanzanians. Not one of them had been to university, but they'd all worked with NGOs in forestry and agriculture and so forth, and health. And it was that team that went into the villages. It wasn't a bunch of arrogant white people saying, gosh, you know, you, you really are having a bad, tough time here, and this is what we're going to do to make your lives better. No, it was sitting and listening to the people in the village and asking them what they felt would make their lives better. And they wanted to grow more food, they wanted better health and education facilities. That's where we began, working with the Tanzanian, the local Tanzanian uh, government, because we had so little money just a tiny grant from the European Union to work in 12 villages. And as they came to trust us, we were able to suggest other interventions which we felt would be useful. And from my point, I think the most successful, or one of the most successful, has been microcredit opportunities for women, where they can take out tiny loans for environmentally sustainable projects, like keeping chickens or having a tree nursery and pro programs to protect the watershed, to reforest the slopes, and to try and restore the flow in the streams, all of these things. And trying to get as many scholarships for girls as we could to keep them in school, because it was the boys that got the opportunity, and providing family planning, very important. And the program was successful. I'll come back to later on to just how successful it has been not only helping the people, but helping the chimpanzees too. And as was said earlier, this program, this Takari program, has been introduced into Uganda, into Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, into the Republic of Congo, um, and into Senegal. And it's working. So we are improving the lives of the people. When people say to me, and they so often do, how can you spend all this time working to save chimpanzees when there's so many suffering people? Well, unless we can alleviate the suffering of the people, we'll never be able to conserve the chimpanzees. So that's how this all meshes. But while I'm going around and talking about these things, I'm meeting so many young people, university students, some high school students, thoughtful students. And they seemed not to be very hopeful about the future. Some were depressed, some were angry. Most were just apathetic, they didn't seem to care. They didn't seem to want to think about these things. They just wanted to have a good time. And when I talked to them, they all said more or less the same, we feel like this because we feel you've compromised our future. You generations, you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Have we compromised your future? 
You bet we have. When I look at a small child, as I looked at them in the school this morning, or the little kindergarten and primary school children, and I thought, how we've harmed this beautiful planet since I was that age, it makes me, I don't know, angry, shamed, something. But is it true it's too late? Many biologists will tell you it's too late. We're in the middle of the sixth extinction. It's like being on a big ship, and the lookout sees rocks ahead, and he yells danger, and everybody rushes to help the captain turn the wheel, but the momentum of a big ship will mean that it's going to crash into the rocks and there'll be a shipwreck. That's what many people say is happening to our planet, that it's too late to make change. Well, maybe it is, but I believe it's not. I believe, for reasons which I'll share with you, that there is hope for the future. But that's what led to this Roots and Shoots program. Beginning with 12 high school students, now in 134 countries, one, uh, 150,000 active groups, members from preschool all the way through university, and even with some adult groups. It's changing the world. It's messages that every single one of us makes a difference in this world every single day. And we have a choice as to what kind of difference we're going to make. And I think the reason that so many people are apathetic is if they think about the global picture, they feel helpless, they feel hopeless. The problems are so huge, environmental and social. So what can I, one person, do? There's nothing I can do, so I do nothing. That's the biggest problem I think we have to face today is apathy. So the most important thing is to understand that we do make a difference every day. If it was just me, and I did things like turning off taps and um, thinking about the consequences of what I buy, what I eat, what I wear, where it came from, did it involve cruelty to animals or child slave labor, all those sort of questions, just me, it wouldn't make any difference at all. But as hundreds and then thousands and then millions and eventually billions of people all start thinking those thoughts and making little changes in their life every day, then you start moving towards major change. And when people say, yes, but it's not really making a difference, you know how I like to look at it, as though the, the world can be divided into a huge mosaic of hundreds of thousands of little parts. And in all of those parts, there are problems. And if you look at that whole picture, you can't do anything. You're just hopeless. But take your own little part. Do what you can do for this little piece that's under your nose. And then know, when you see that you've made a difference here, that young people and older people all over the world are doing the same thing. It's not just you who's cleaning a stream and reintroducing fish. That's happening on the other continents too. It's not just you who's working to grow organic food. It's happening all over the world. It's not just you who cares about street children. Other people in other places are caring about street children. And there's a growing awareness and it's coming together and it's beginning to coalesce and make that change, that changed attitude which is so important if we care about the future. So the Roots and Shoots program involves young people making their own choices. That's why I think it's grown so fast. And I hope that many university students here will want to become involved because it's at university level that we really are getting major support in different countries, particularly China, by the way. And so every group is a, a collection of young people coming together and talking about what they care about. And there's always some who care about animals. There's always some who care about human suffering. There's always some who care about the degradation of the environment, the pollution, and so forth. And so every young person in a Roots and Shoots group can roll up their sleeves and take action to do something that they feel passionate about. And I can tell you, as I'm traveling all around the world all this time, these young people are making a huge difference. And not only are they changing things in the world around them, it's changing them. 
I've seen inner city kids who are hopeless and caught up in gangs and they get involved in this program. They are empowered, we listen to them, we help them to, to carry out their projects and they change and they suddenly have faith in themselves and in their own future. That's why I'm traveling 300 days a year. That's why I care so much. My reasons for hope are fourfold. And that's how I will end with my reasons for hope. The first is the energy, commitment, uh, dedication, and actually courage of so many young people once they know the problems and are empowered to take action. That's what I see as I travel around all the time. That's what I saw this morning. That's what I heard from different groups. Magical. My second reason for hope is this brain. Now, we're very like chimpanzees. I talked about the similarities, but obviously we're different. Chimps, they don't address groups like you. If they did, they wouldn't have a microphone. They wouldn't have any lights. So the biggest difference, I think, between us and the chimpanzees is, and other animals too, is this explosive development of our intellect. Animals are way more intelligent than we used to think. We know now that birds can solve problems. We know the intelligence of elephants. And if you want to have your mind changed forever about rhinos, just Google Mechi, M-E-C-H-I, the painting rhino, and you will see a one and a half minute video that will change your mind, it changed mine anyway. So, um, you know, so all these animals, they can communicate and they can do far more intelligent things than we ever used to think. But what have we done? We've sent a rocket all the way up to Mars, the red planet. And when the rocket got there successfully, it opened a door and out crawled a little robot. And that robot is still crawling around on the surface of the red planet and sharing photographs with us as to what it looks like. So how is it possible that this most intellectual species is destroying its only home? What's happened? Don't we realize? You know, we do realize. I think we've lost something called wisdom, where people would make a decision only after asking, how will this affect people in future generations, our own children and grandchildren and theirs? And today that so often doesn't happen and huge decisions are made by multinationals and by governments based on how will this help me now? How will this help my next election campaign? How will this help the next shareholders meeting in three months? So how has this happened? I think there's a disconnect. Something's gone wrong. I think it's money and greed and the lust for power but there's been a disconnect between this clever brain and the human heart. That's love and compassion and altruism. And somehow, to achieve our true human potential, we have to find a way of working with our brain, our mind, and my heart, and, and our hearts in unison. That's got to happen. And I think it's you young people that's going to make that happen. I think as around the world, more and more young people realize, yes, we need money to live, but let's not live for money. Some people are really good at making money. I love it if they use that money for the right purpose. I love it if they use some of their money to help the Jane Goodall Institute to do what we do. Great, please raise more money and share more money because we need it to do what we do. And that's why you heard earlier, if any of you can make a, a donation, it will really help us. And Roots and Chutes is just a program of the Jane Goodall Institute. So your donation can be used to help captive chimps go into a sanctuary, or it can be used to develop Roots and Chutes here in South Africa. Um, well, the chimpanzee sanctuary is Chimp Eden, that's in South Africa too. And we need to build a new fence. So the human brain, then the resilience of nature. You must all have seen a place that we destroyed and made ugly, and given time, nature can reassert itself. And the best example is what's happened around Gombe. Once we got the villagers on our side, once they became our partners, instead of being slightly upset that a group of white people were coming messing about with monkeys while they starve, now they trust us. 
Now they have better lives. And so they have set land aside around Gombe from their village lands. And they haven't, we haven't planted trees. We've just left it. And within 10 years, the seeds lying in that ground have grown up. And there are some trees already 30 foot high. So that the chimps today have, ten, have three times more forest than they had 10 years ago. So all around Gombe, we are restoring the forest. We go further south using the same methods. We're protecting the forest and the chimpanzees who are there. So the resilience of nature, animal species on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. One of the groups this morning of these children, they're working with the southern leopard toad, which is close to extinction. And the imagination and the things that they're doing, and of course they're working with conservation groups, and I believe they're going to save the leopard toad, and their parents are involved, and there's notices along the road. And I just wrote a book called Hope for Animals and Their World. So inspirational, because every chapter is about a species that would not be on this planet now if it wasn't for a group of amazing and dedicated people. And that's my last reason for hope, the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle seemingly impossible tasks and don't give up. And one of the icons that I have always mentioned was Nelson Mandela. And for years I went around with a piece of uh, limestone from Robin Island Prison. A man who can be 17 years in hard physical labor, who can be 23 years jailed, and who can come out with this amazing ability to forgive and lead your nation out of the evil regime of apartheid without a bloodbath. What an amazing man. And there are people, other people like that, Martin Luther King. We can mention many icons. But the, the indomitable human spirit is all around us. You meet people, just ordinary people, people down the street, people who started a little shop. And you just go in, you buy a newspaper, and you go out. But if you bother to talk, sometimes you find that person has overcome so many social problems, so much poverty, and yet there they are, smiling at you as you buy your newspaper. And there are people with unbelievable physical disabilities who are leaving, leading absolutely inspirational lives. I met somebody in Canada the other day, and he was born with no legs and his, no arms uh, long, uh, beyond, beyond his elbow. He has one thumb sticking out of his elbow, and coming out of his uh, thigh somewhere, his buttocks, is one little flipper like a foot. And when I met him, he had just been raising money to help the zoo after major floods in Calgary, and he had said that he would climb the 120 steps to the top of the tower in half an hour to raise money. And I watched him go up one step in the auditorium like this. He had to turn backwards, give a huge push with that little flipper, and land thump on his bottom. And he did these 120 steps in 20 minutes. What an amazing man. He's an inspirational speaker now. When you meet him, if you just see him and talk to him, he, his face is alight and shining with the joy of life. How inspirational is that? And my little friend who's fallen over on the floor here. This is a very famous little person. His name is Mr. H. He was given to me 27 years ago for my birthday by a man who was in the US Marines. He was in a terrible accident in his helicopter. He went totally blind. And while he was learning to live in this frightening dark world, he met a magician. He decided to become a magician. Everybody said, but Gary, Gary Horn is his name. Gary, you can't be a good magician if you're blind. And he said, well, I can try. He's so good. If he was standing here, you wouldn't know he was blind. I've watched him four times. He's amazing. And at the end, he would say to you, you know, something might go wrong in your life because we never know. But if it does, don't give up. There's always a way forward. He has been here diving in a cage with great white sharks. He has climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. He does skydiving. I mean, I think it's crazy to jump out of an airplane anyway, but to jump out into total black void is utterly crazy. That's how he is. 
He thought he was giving me a stuffed chimpanzee, and I said, Gary, I know you can't see, it's the wrong color and everything, but I made him hold the tail. Uh, he said, oh, well, never mind, take him where you go, and you know I'm with you in spirit. So those are the messages I wanted to leave you with. But of all of them, the most important is don't forget that every day you live, you make a difference on this planet. And I sincerely hope that many of you will want to help us in our efforts to make the world a better place, to join this growing family of roots and shoots. One of the young men who helped start it back in Tanzania in 91, I was asking him what it had meant to him. And he said, well, first it was fun doing things that I cared about with my friends. Second, I discovered that the harder you work, the better you feel. And thirdly, he said, the most important thing of all, I know that anywhere I go in the world, even if I know nobody, if there's a group of roots and shoots, I've found my family. And so that's why I hope you'll join us to be part of this growing family of young people who have in your hands the power to help transform the world, to make it a better place for your grandchildren and mine. Thank you. And thank you for that, by the way. That, that gives me hope, too, that you responded that way because it shows you care and that you're going to help. Jane has agreed to take a few questions um, before we, uh, let's say, 10 minutes of questions and answers. So I'll take three questions and then hand over to her to respond. Um, I saw one hand there. We'll start with you. Yeah. Just speak loudly, and if, they can't, if others can't hear you, I'll repeat the question, because it'll take time for the mics to get around. Well, thank you for your inspiration. Um, I'd like to ask, do you think animals, um, chimpanzees, do you think they can hope? Do you think they can hope? Um, can I answer them one by one? It's easier. Yes, certainly. Um, I, I don't know. I doubt it. I think hope... To, to be able to hope, you need to have a real concept of the future. And they have some concept of the future, but to actually hope the way we hope, I sort of doubt it, but a chimpanzee imprisoned in a medical research lab in a five foot by five foot cage, does he hope he'll get out? He probably may, but perhaps not in quite the way that we would. So I can't answer the question, but it's a very good question. These are the kind of philosophical questions that help us think about human and chimpanzee differences and help to define what we are as humans. Thank you. Yes, sir. You mean the, the rights for chimpanzees? Okay, well... Um, first of all, there's a misconception that people are trying to give human rights to chimpanzees, which they're not. They're try trying to give certain rights which we accord to humans also to chimpanzees, the right to life and liberty and freedom from torture. And I think it's a, it's a noble um, goal. I think that it's causing people to think in a different way. I personally, myself, have always moved in the direction of human responsibility. The reason for that is that the Human Rights Bill has been signed for I don't know how many years, and there are human rights abusers every single day all around the world. So giving chimps rights 
would, would be helpful in some ways. Possibly they couldn't be used in medical research, but we're getting around to that anyway by working on is this the right thing to do and is it ethical. So uh, they just had one case in the US. They tried to, uh, they tried to prosecute on behalf of a chimpanzee, the owner of that chimpanzee who'd kept him in not good conditions, and that case was lost. That was the first of its kind. So I don't know where it will go. Thank you. Right at the back there, yeah. Then go ahead. Did I genuinely feel what? Accepted into the Accepted. community. Well, um, you know, when Diane Fossey studied the mountain gorillas, she wanted to sit in the, oh, she did, she sat on the lap of the alpha male and they exchanged communications between her and the gorillas. I didn't want that. I've always wanted to observe them as through a window and see their life uncontaminated as much as possible by the observer and to do that, they have to accept you as part of the environment. And so that's what we've all striven for. And now that we know the danger of chimpanzees catching our diseases, we have quite strict rules about the distance you have to keep. Uh, but of course, when I began, we didn't know anything about that. We didn't know that chimps and humans shared 98.5% of DNA. Um, so. But I, I, I always have wanted to observe and not actually be part of their community. Thank you. There's a question right there, yes, man in the check shirt. Yeah. Just speak a bit louder, the mic isn't picking you up. Just Where are you? Now. Wave. I can't even there see you. you. Stand up ah, there we Thank are. You. Yeah. That's better. Yeah, there, there, actually, there actually are. We're about to start a volunteer program um, in Kigoma, which is the place, uh, the, the little town near, near, near Gombe, which will involve going out into the villages, maybe into the schools, helping educate, because a lot of problems caused by lack of education. Uh, there are programs like in Congo, Congo Brazzaville, they take some volunteers to look after the chimps in the sanctuary. We have 163 chimpanzees in the sanctuary because these are the victims of the bushmeat trade where the mother's been shot and the infant has been left orphaned. And it's all illegal, so the government will confiscate the infant, but then they have to be looked after. So there are opportunities there. And the best thing is if you get in touch with the Jane Goodall Institute here in South Africa, and they can run you through a list of uh, possible ways that you could get involved and volunteer. So that would be the best. And that's um, Jane Goodall. Well, actually, um, Margie, are you there? Yeah. You're there, Margie. And is, is um, well, come up so people can see you. Or wave, or so stand there and wave. So, and the website is janegoodall.co.za. Yeah. So you can do that, but also this is Margie, and I think you're Margie at janegoodall.co.ca. So Margie, just remember Margie, M-A-R-G-I. Any other questions? Yeah, okay. And Juliet, is she here or is she outside somewhere? Juliet is there. Juliet, Juliet, you turn around so they can see you. Juliet. Uh, runs Roots and Shoots in South Africa. Uh, both of these ladies are doing an amazing job, and both of them will be really happy if you see some of the people with the badge on, Jane Goodall Institute badge, on your way out. And even if you make a tiny donation, it all helps. It's like people making their own little difference in this big mosaic. 
So don't be embarrassed if you can't give uh, a large sum of money. But whatever you have, if you can give it, it truly will help because little bits add up. I was always taught as a child, look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. I'm not sure it's always true, but anyway, <laughs> it's, it's the right sort of um, feeling, I think. We'll Tell take one more question. Um, yeah. Well, you probably couldn't hear it. Do you want to repeat the question? I don't suppose everybody could the, hear it. The question, in a, in a world so uh, controlled by multinationals and powerful governments, what can an organization like Roots and Shoots do to increase its lobbying and advocacy power? Okay. Well, you know, this is the thing. When young people get together and they're really determined to make a difference, there can be major changes made. Just recently in China, there was a landmark decision by the government to ban shark's fin soup in, uh, in, in all official uh, dinners and lunches and things like that. Now, that's a major decision by the Chinese government. And there was a huge Roots and Shoots involvement in the demonstrations that were made. That their their um, participation in Shanghai, Beijing, Chengdu, and some, several other places was commented on by many newspapers because they made these beautiful large sharks which they held up on sticks and the fins of course were cut off and blood was dripping down. And it was educating the people about what shark's fin soup actually did to the sharks. So um, we don't go in for violence and demonstrations have to be peaceful, but our Roots and Shoots <coughs> members around the world are actually making a difference in many ways like that. We've had demonstrations against gen genetically modified food. We've had demonstrations against uh, an animals in medical research labs and things like that. So the main thing is to get involved, find out the facts. But what I would urge is whatever it is that you're doing, be absolutely sure before you start getting involved that you know the real facts because it can backfire horribly if you start talking about facts that were true three years ago or even 10 years ago, but they're not true anymore. That damages the whole cause. So the most important thing is to get the facts. And you know, there's one other little pearl of wisdom that my mother taught me that might be useful to share. And that's when you meet somebody you disagree with, you know, it's terribly tempting to get into a real argument and you get angry and, you know, they're saying things that you feel are terribly wrong and animals are being hurt or people are being abused and you get angry. You watch two people. You can do it sometimes on televised debates. Once they start arguing like that, they stop listening to each other. You see it again and again because when the other side is talking, you're thinking, well, he's saying that. Now, how am I going to refute it? So you're not really listening. And my mother always used to say, if you disagree with somebody, the first thing you must do is listen. And maybe, just maybe, they've got some points that you never thought about. And maybe you can find some points where you share the same, the same um, philosophy. And maybe you may have to compromise because most progress is in steps. And we get agitated because we want it to happen now. But in fact, as long as you don't compromise your values, many, many changes are done in these small steps, which do sometimes mean making a compromise, both sides. I want to start by uh, once again thanking you on behalf of this audience and behalf of the uh, thousands of people who will be watching this live streamed for the most inspirational uh, talk, for the inspirational life you've lived, and for the message of hope, which I think as you, you put your finger on, on the problem in, at many points in your talk, um, the sense often of hopelessness or of what difference can an individual make, and the many examples you've given of how individuals have made a difference and how the many individuals working together can change the world and can ensure that 
uh, we have a future for our children and grandchildren. Uh, I want to first give you a small uh, gift of our appreciation from the university and from the audience to say thank you so much for being here, for sharing uh, your experiences and your vision with us. Um, and then I want to invite um, Lauren Gillis, who's the co-founder of Relate, to come up quickly and um, just give a message to the audience as well. This is for you, and thank you so much. A friend of mine in this audience said, I had the privilege of meeting Oprah Winfrey recently, but when I heard of the possibility of meeting or seeing or being in the same space as Jane Goodall, she said, there's no words. She said, that has to be a highlight of my life. I'm still shaking. I think certainly this is a highlight of many of our lives. And I'm just so privileged, we at Relate Bracelets, we have a very simple tool and we partner with the Jane Goodall Institute, a simple beaded bracelet with an R on it to uplift communities and at the same time to raise funds and awareness for the Jane Goodall Institute. But tonight, it's something really extra special. We are honoring a milestone birthday, I won't even give the number, that is about to be both for Jane and for Isajal. And I want to present, present Jane with the, our special bracelet, um, it's a plain, simple black bracelet, and people are going to wonder why has it got blue and a pinkish red on it, but those are two of Jane's favorite colors. And we've got a unique opportunity. We've been asked to open up our purses and be as generous as we can to these amazing causes tonight. But over and above that, we have an opportunity to leave just like there's the connection we can leave connected to an incredible human being, an incredible life, an inspiration to all of us, and somebody who has certainly changed this world and encouraging each and every one of us to just do one thing, to make a difference. So our opportunities to leave here wearing a Jane Goodall special birthday bracelet and to Get them for your friends, for your family, and to know that they will be like a wearable tattoo connecting you to an incredible life and honoring a special, special lady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. So, ladies and gentlemen, this brings our evening to an end. Um, there's a large crowd, and I'm sure many of you would have wanted to meet Jane personally. We have to find some way of managing this, and what we've decided to do is to allow any of you who have brought books that Jane has authored and want to have them autographed to come up to the stage. We'll have a table and she'll sign it. We're only going to allow... Uh, between five and ten minutes, ten minutes maximum for that. I'm afraid we can't have everyone coming up. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I just ask you to show once again our appreciation for this most inspiring and wonderful event this evening. Thank you. Thank you.